Okay, I, I want to speak a little bit about the the worldliness of the university, and I want to speak about that. In ter- I mean, I'm, I'm a professor of English, so I'm going to speak about physics. Um, I, I think I want to speak about about uh, something to do with uh, force. And this is going to be slightly unlike all the other papers that I've heard so far today because it's it's not very empirical. It's not, as it were, um, detailing what's currently going on in the university in any direct way. It's kind of going about it in a slightly indirect way. Uh, the university, as an institution that's both in the world and of the world, has a particular relation, it seems to me, with force. The play of forces that shape the very constitution of the material world is fundamental to physics and to many other laboratory sciences. But much more than this... The university also has a relation to the ways in which force shapes the social polity or civil society. And the question I think for today, my question for today is, what is the proper relation of the worldly secular university to civil society itself? (coughs) After the student revolutions of 1968, Hannah Arendt thought about this. In her great work on violence, she makes a distinction between what she calls the force of nature and the force of circumstance, which she calls la force des choses. The, the former of these, force of nature, is the business of physics and science. The latter, the force of circumstance, is the business of social sciences and humanities. You know, we are concerned, I suppose, with organisations of power, authority, and forces of circumstance. At one level, then, the university seems to me must take an interest in force. And in what follows, I will be interested in relating the force of nature to questions of cultural and social power and authority and in how these can be articulated by a university that is avowedly worldly in and of the material world. Well, Arendt, let's go back to her. She was writing in the wake of student uprisings in the US and across Europe in 1968. And those uprisings had one very specific fountainhead, which was American involvement in the Vietnam War. They also had a steady supply of energy in the students who mobilised across campus and, and cities in great numbers. There's a very good uh, book that was made in, in 1968 about the French Revolution 1968 by Patrick Seal and Morton McConville. And they write this in that book, French Revolution 68. Students are far better equipped for insurrection than most adults recognise. They have time to plot, freedom from bread and butter constraints, the confidence of their class and education, faculty buildings in which to meet, above all, energy. The energy to march from one end of Paris to the other, to fight all night, and still be fit enough to draft, print, and distribute a revolutionary tract before dawn. (laughs) Adults are no match for such demonic stamina. Well, that was 1968. Here we are some 50 years later, and the position of the student has dramatically changed, as we know, as has the socially widespread understanding of what the university is for in a civil society. The more recent version of the student, our contemporary version, is one that has been stripped of much of the dynamic energy and force She or he is seen increasingly simply as human capital, essentially as the operative of the systems of capital and resource management, including human resource management. In short, the student has become increasingly treated as fodder for the ongoing smooth operations of the machinery that constitutes our current societies. And as we heard this morning, also the student in many ways is increasingly treated as fodder for league table stuff as well, which is uh, uh, appalling and insulting. Well, in the market-driven audit culture that dominates the present conception of what the university is for, the student clearly does not have time to plot. Rather, all their time is accounted for. So-called continuous assessment has made their learning time a constantly pressurised surveillance, actually, of continual examination. Preparation for that examination is itself accounted for in so-called contact hour time, which has to be maximised, quantity being measurable trumping quality in this. Far from being free of bread and butter issues, student debt constantly exacerbated by a process whereby the costs of a general education of the population are transferred to individuals as personal debt is a constantly increasing worry. To counter that, students are now increasingly part-time, even including those who do not declare themselves to be part-time, given that they have to try to find paid employment simply to sustain them in their period of study. In addition to all of this, the gains of modern technology are now also invading the very idea of the university as a place for people to meet, what used to be called a collegium. As faculty are increasingly encouraged and joined, required to deploy computing technology as an axiomatically good teaching aid, lectures become podcasts, seminar notes are pasted online, and in many cases, students no longer need to be physically present as a force in a classroom. The classroom is in danger of becoming not even a marketplace with all the noise, hubbub and social engagement that that would imply. At best, it's in danger of becoming a purely virtual space, a kind of Amazon resource that substitutes the real or historical engagement of the market 
with a virtual Google-eyed atomized individualism. The force then of getting people together, the dynamics, the energy that happens when you get people together is in danger of being dissipated through technology. And the idea of a collegium, such as the students of 1968 in Paris would have known it in Le Grand Fi in, in the Sorbonne, the big amphitheater at the Sorbonne, all of that is diminished. All of these changes, it seems to me, are changes in the dynamics of force and energy, not just of individual students, but also of the university itself. It's not simply the case that students have become less politically engaged. The frequent lament of a kind of 68 hour faculty. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a wee bit, I mean, despite appearances, I'm a wee bit too young to actually be a, a, a 68 hour myself. I kind of, I was a wee boy in Glasgow watching people throwing stones at the police and thinking that looked really good. I, you know, I wanted to, I kind of wanted to be part of that, but I was too young, sadly. Anyway, uh, the frequent lament, as you know, of uh, 68 of are that students have become less politically engaged. But actually, much more importantly, it's the case that the university institution, as a force within civil society, has been diminished, it seems to me. That's the, that's the key thing here. The, the energy, the dynamics, the force of an institution itself has diminished. Well, Hannah Arendt was writing in a period dominated by the concerns that the military-industrial complex, as Eisenhower called it, had infiltrated the university. Eisenhower's warning was stark and indeed prescient. With the rise of the military-industrial complex, he said, the university itself was being fundamentally changed. This is from his farewell speech when he's standing down as president. Quote, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research, in which, for example, I quote again, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. Well, to put that in brief, it's prescient of our present state of affairs because money in and of itself becomes a key determinant of what universities are for. And secondly, governmental interference aligns the university with the forces of the state rather than the forces of the people. Arendt had already worried about all of this. When Karl Jaspers, her mentor, sent her a copy of his great book, The Idea of the University, which he rewrote in 1946 in a moment when he was trying to denazify the German university sector, Hannah Arendt wrote back to Jasper saying that she approved of the work. But she pointed out that since it would be expensive to fund a revitalised sector in Germany, clearly, she says, the state has to bear the costs because it's so expensive. And yet, she says, it's also equally vital that the sector remains depoliticised and that the professors must not become civil servants. They should not see their work as being that of the agent of the state. And actually, in the German constitution, um, Article 5.3, if I remember correctly, the German constitution, points out that there must, you know, the, the state provides the money, but it must not interfere politically with learning, teaching, and, and, and research. In an earlier address in the United States, Eisenhower, an address called Science, Handmaiden of Freedom, Eisenhower argued that the search for fundamental knowledge can best be undertaken in areas and in ways determined primarily by the scientific community itself. Regimented research would be, for us, catastrophe. Well, that whole Cold War rhetorical framework offers, it seems to me, a clear manifestation of how worldly the university needs to be, but it also gives us a description of how bad we have been because we've not paid attention to what Eisenhower was saying there. It indicates that being worldly does not involve a strategic political position in which communities and people are best served by direct governmental control of the university and of its activities. In fact, the argument even from the right of the political centre at that point is that science and research were returned to the determining force of intellectual curiosity and that such a return is perfectly aligned with the interests of good citizenship and human freedom. Uh, in passing, at this moment in the, in the mid-20th century, when Eisenhower was saying these things, freedom, of course, was much more than it was to become under a later uh, American president, President Bush II, when freedom became the freedom to go shopping, and nothing more than that. Well, Eisenhower's warnings have gone unheeded, it seems to me. However, it's no longer the, the intimacy of the university with military force that is primarily an issue, but rather a new intimacy between the university and other forces, usually financial forces, in which freedom has indeed been reduced to consumer choice, the freedom to go shopping. So if we're to address this problem, we need to address what the university is for. Okay. You've arrived, arrived at the really good bit. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> so for to address this problem, I think we need to address what the university is for. And at the moment, it seems to me that it's for money. And it's for the, the increasing disparity between the 1% and the rest. That's to say, 
it has given in to the dominant force of what Joseph Stiglitz initially referred to as the 1%. And I want to speak a little, little bit more about resources and force. And I go off now on a slightly different tangent, and I'll get back to the point eventually, don't worry. In the wake of the first war, you know, all these things are as we're post-war, and we are also currently, it seems to me, post-war, uh, and that's quite important. In the wake of the first war in 1919, the French poet and thinker and critic and semi-philosopher Paul Valéry wrote two letters to the Athenaeum, a kind of uh, center left ish liberal uh, English journal. Those letters were subsequently published as The Crisis of the Spirit, that's what they were called. And in those letters, he comes up with what he called a fundamental theorem regarding force. The world, he says, is unequal and uneven. And it's uneven because of the uneven distribution of natural resources, the forces of nature, to go back to the thing I was talking about at the beginning, von Hanten and Hara Arendt. The world, he says, is fundamentally predisposed to inequality and to unequal distribution. However, it's not the case that the areas of the world that are richest in the forces of nature are the most powerful or wealthiest. He's puzzled by this. And he says, you know, if it is the case, if my fundamental theorem is right, that we live in what elsewhere Trotsky was calling combined and uneven development, if we live in a state of affairs whereby there are, as it were, unequal resources in the world which predispose one constitution or country to be richer than the other because it's richer in, in natural resources, then how come, he says, small countries with not much in the way of natural resources, like, for example, the UK, are in such positions of huge imperial power? It's a very complicated argument, but at the core of it, he says, uh, the, the reason for the, the fact that the UK, although it's rather small, outweighs uh, those other parts of the world that are uh, much richer in natural resources is to be found in the fact that the UK has something that is derived from Greece, geometry. Geometry is a shorthand term here for a whole mode of civilization a whole weight mode of intellectual force, a whole mode of what you could call the forces of circumstance. And he sees this as being at the core of what he calls the European spirit. There's a, 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 cer a certain kind of racism that's, as it were, taken for granted within what he's writing at the time. But nonetheless, it seems to me it's quite important that he's posing what he calls a European spirit, a spirit that he characterises as having a burning but disinterested curiosity, a scepticism, and an eager aspiration for progress, he said that that has the power of outweighing the natural resources of the rest of the world, the, the otherwise more powerful places. But here's the complication. This spirit, he says, has been commercialised. It has been packaged now, sold as a package. It has, been, it has entered the world of business it has entered the world of, as it were, the commercialization of knowledge as such. And the result of that is that the intrinsically weak, in this case Europe, which is low in the forces of nature or natural resources, loses the countervailing force that it once held over those other places in the world through its civilization, as he calls it. You can put this very, very simply. Cast your mind back to when you were in primary school and there was a school bully who was big. She or he had big body, big weight, big natural resources. I faced them, I was weak, pathetic, hopeless, but I was smart. My smartness, my geometry, my uh, cleverness as it were, allowed me to equalize the terrain between us. However, if we're, we're in a state of affairs where the bully also gets access to the technology, as it were, by buying it, then something significant happens the bully regains their position of power. And nowadays, what you get here is that inequality, based again on natural force, natural resources, we could talk about oil, reasserts itself. So those natural resources nowadays are themselves determining the priorities of the university. Oil is still one of the world's most important natural resources, and it's key to the ways in which the sector engages with energy, broadly conceived, my idea of force. Energy is in turn instrumental in ensuring uneven development and unequal access to power for the world's citizens. In fact, its centrality helps to determine the status of citizenship. Joseph Stiglitz points out that in Congress in 2011, US Congress in 2011, there were well over 2,000 lobbyists working for the energy and natural resources industries. That translates as about four lobbyists in, from these industries for each and every Congress person and that more than $3.2 billion was spent on lobbying in that year. 
Now, that $3.2 billion was not spent in lobbying in order to ensure the more equal distribution of wealth and access to power and access to, if you like, the forces of circumstance in the US sector. On the contrary, it was determined, it was used to determine that power would be maintained in the hands of the 1%. So the consequence here is that we do not have a citizenship democracy of one person, one vote. Rather, we have what Joe Stiglitz describes as one dollar, one vote. And that works, obviously, to the benefit of the 1%. Thanks. I've got one paragraph. In the end, then, it seems to me the university surely has to be recalled to its fundamental purpose of widening participation, the massification of the sector, as it were. And in doing that, it has to be recalled to its fundamental purpose to stand not for the 1%, but to contest the forces of nature that help the strong bully against the weak. And that means, it seems to me, taking a stand for the 99%, which means that the university has to be recalled to a purpose for the more equal distribution of wealth, for a rediscovery of the civilization, as he called it, of which Valérie spoke, and now, more importantly than ever, in the wake of the disasters of war. I'll stop on that, and thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.